Hello and good afternoon. Uh, my name is H.G. Chazelle and welcome to our first AEG LinkedIn Live Roundtable. Today we're going to be talking about an exciting task force developed in Washington, D.C. with the strong leadership of D.C. Water. On January 13th, 2021, Keisha Powell, Chief Operating Officer for D.C. Water, delivered the following winning obstacle statement for the AEG Washington Stakeholder Challenge. Regarding critical infrastructure and resilience for greater DC to achieve its carbon and equity goals, the most critical obstacle for DC water to overcome, which requires collaboration, is the lack of a unified district-wide portfolio of project opportunities prioritized by cost benefit, resilience, carbon, vulnerability, and equity goals in a manner that aligns collaborators and expedites funding. By the end of 2021, this intersectional task force pledged to develop three scoring tools to assess the DC water portfolio of projects based on carbon, equity, and vulnerability. Based on this data, the task force is now developing a value effort matrix to aggregate and score the entire portfolio of project opportunities. During this session, you will hear from leaders of the DC Water Task Force who will, who will review their approach, challenges, accomplishments, and key upcoming next steps, especially around stakeholder engagement. My name is H.G. Chazelle, founder and CEO of Advanced Energy Group. I'll be your host. To start, to start things off today, we will hear from Cheryl Uday. Cheryl is a senior advisor to the Chief Operating Officer for DC Water. Followed, following Cheryl, we'll hear from Dr. Matthew Reese. Matthew is the DC Water uh, Director of Sustainability and Watershed Management. And we'll also hear from Apra Ungwara, Senior Program Manager of Government Affairs for DC Water. We've got a great program for you today. I'm very excited to get things started. Let me bring the first speaker to the, the floor here. Cheryl, welcome. Let me bring you in. Much, um, HG, and you can hear me okay, right? Just want to check before we yes, before I jump in. Great. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for allowing myself and my team to be here this morning on behalf of DC Water, our CEO, Mr. Gaddis, and our COO Keisha Powell, we are beyond enthusiastic to be a part of such an effort, such an innovative effort that is really just pushing us forward um, in areas of equity and resilience and helping us to just think about our future and how we are approaching it and being as proactive as possible with the community really at the heart of it all. So as HG mentioned, um, the last eight months has been incredibly exciting. Um, our team has engaged in just a new form of collaboration and thought partnerships with several of our leaders across the district, but certainly outside of the region as well, to tackle some of our hardest issues and to allow us to think bigger as we think about carbon equity and resilience. And so we'll spend today really sharing um, our thoughts and our approaches and how we essentially have ground ourselves in equity um, at the root of really all of this work. So if we can advance to the next slide, so I can tell you how we'll be spending um, the next 20 minutes of our time. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about the challenge um, that we have taken on here at DC Water along with our task force and our partners. We will talk about how our task force was actually structured, which I think was um, pretty unique um, for this, this type of engagement with 40 plus leaders. We'll give you a little bit of our project status of as of August 2021, and then we'll jump right into talking about our approach. Um, how did we strategize? How are we thinking about these? And importantly, how are we operationalizing equity? How are we thinking about um, how we approach carbon reduction? And how are we becoming the most sustainable uh, region for the future? We'll talk a little bit about those, the actual tools that we've used to develop um, and follow from this approach. And then um, lastly, but certainly not least, how we are engaging our stakeholders, how we are ensuring that our partners are not just involved, but walking alongside of this, us, alongside of us along the way. 
And then how are we going to be reaching out to the community to ensure that their input also helps to inform and drive the design of the work that we do? I, I wanted to start before we advance to the next slide by really talking about the core and the heart of this work, which is our equity definition. Um, we spent about a month as a task force team developing this because we felt like in order for us to really be able to move this work forward, it was first um, incredibly important for us as a task force, although coming from different backgrounds, literally speaking different languages in terms of how we talk about this work to really align and to level set on how we viewed our impact on the community. And so on this screen, you see our equity definition, which is impartial access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy through inclusion and engagement of our disadvantaged communities or those who are most um, under-resourced to enhance community resilience, health, and safety and support, um, the district's climate change and our sustainability objectives. And if we can go ahead and advance to the next slide, please, so I can talk a little bit about how we got organized. Um, and, and actually, um, before we go into that, I will um, hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Matthew Reese, who will be talking about um, the challenge overall and how DC Water plays a role um, up against the following, the, the other quarters within the challenge. Thanks, Matthew. All right, great. Looks like the mic's working. Yes. Excellent. Thanks, HG. And thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how this all fits into the big picture. Uh, we are part of AEG Washington. Uh, the, in that AEG Washington challenge, there are multiple challenges moving together in parallel. And AEG, as our convener, is also hosting these challenges in other cities at the same time. What that does, and we put this graphic together to help kind of explain how, you know, what our role is in this with AEG as an overall convener. So when HG kicked us off, he talked a little bit about the challenge back in January where our COO, Keisha Powell, put our challenge forward. We competed against other organizations to have the privilege of working with AEG for the next 12 months and to move towards that final deliverable of developing a refined outline of, of projects, DC water projects which look at, as we've discussed, which look at equity, which look at carbon reduction, which look at vulnerability as a whole. Um, so while we're doing that at DC Water, there are also these parallel challenges happening at the same time. One of the things that does is frankly, it keeps us honest. We have established these milestones on a quarterly basis. We check in with the other teams when they convene on a quarterly basis. And it's also this way, you know, one of the big benefits to participating in this AEG challenge is that we're getting a really broad spectrum of perspectives, um, not only from the task force that we've assembled that we're working closely with over the 12 months, but then also in getting input from these other groups that are addressing other challenges related to the district's carbon goals as well. So I wanted to put this in there just to show that there, there's a lot of activity happening with the AEG challenge and, and we're really appreciative of being able to engage with such a wide group of stakeholders, which is really kind of broaden our thinking about how we approach our goals uh, to help the district meet their carbon goals. Uh, so DC Water being the single largest consumer of energy in the district certainly has a role to play there. And uh, that is being factored in as we think about what ultimately our portfolio is. And really that's what this is about. We are developing a portfolio of projects. It's not a single project we're after. It's not the top two or three. It's how do we create this spectrum of projects which are gonna have different levels of value. And we'll, we'll talk about how we're assessing the value of these projects when we get into the tools here. But first I'm gonna hand it back to Charles and talk a little bit about how our task force is structured. Thank you, thank you so much, Matt. So um, on our, our next slide um, that you'll see in a second, um, it will, um, it demonstrates how we got organized. So one of the first things that we've realized with SAP, one, it was going to be an incredible amount of, of work. Um, and I think all of our task force members who have stepped up and literally volunteered their time over the last eight months, um, simply behind a passion for this work and wanting to see it through. 
and realizing the best way for us to be effective was to get organized around um, a group of subcommittees. So on this uh, slide that you see here, we have our task force co-chair who sits at the top, who really champions this work, uh, Keisha Powell, our chief operating officer. Uh, Dr. Matthew Reese and myself are the task force co-leads. So we ensure that um, we are bringing together the meeting of the minds on a bi-weekly basis. And then we have our list of our task force agencies. So we have several leaders across the agencies that you see on this slide from um, Amoresco, um, um, MW COG, um, and we also have others who are outside of the region from the state of Illinois, um, urban ingenuity. Um, of course, we have several leaders across DC water. So all those that you see there, um, which brought us to, again, a group of about uh, 30 to 40 leaders who meet regularly to review our milestones. Um, from that task force group, we have a list of five subcommittees that we stood up within the first month of running uh, this, this initiative. And our equity team actually led um, much of the work on the early part, which again was really defining and grounding us on how we are defining equity within the context of this challenge specifically. Our carbon team was helping to level set us around the district's carbon goals and really defining what the, those carbon reduction um, looks like and the potentials of that for this project. And then our project portfolio and funding team um, was as, as ensuring that we were broadly looking across our project portfolio, as well as helping um, um, alongside Dr. Matthew Reese, looking at the value and the effort um, and how we would ensure that we could actually create an implementable list of projects. And our policy team was looking at uh, current as well as potential policy, either in legislative, either changes or opportunities as a result of this work. And our stakeholder and community engagement committee um, were, was identifying what stakeholders in the community that we needed to educate um, about this process, but it also ensure that we're taking their input. And, um, also identifying where either help is needed or where there might be opportunities to partner. And so that's been an ongoing effort that you'll hear more about today. Each subcommittee has been led by a, a DC Water uh, lead as well as other, uh, other partners within this effort. The next uh, slide beyond how we got organized early on within, within this engagement, all of these tasks, uh, excuse me, subcommittees drove the work forward very, very quickly. And so where we are as far as today, and you'll hear a little bit about and see some of those um, efforts is, again, we've defined equity within the context of this challenge, which I read earlier. We've actually created um, in a very innovative way, I think, in a, a thought leadership kind of way and tested actual scoring mechanisms, actual tools that we use to assess and to score carbon uh, reduction potentials, resilience as far around community and infrastructure, as well as equity. What, what are the right questions to ask before engaging in large infrastructure work? Um, from there, um, we are, have scored and initiated some of our scoring around value. What is the amount of value back to the community, back to DC Water, all of our partners as, as a result of engaging in this project work? And then what kind of effort does it actually take to be able to implement such work? So you'll hear a little bit about that today. And of course, we are continuing to explore stakeholder advocacy and funding opportunities because without those, we will not, cannot um, push this work forward. So we understand that infrastructure is not just project, but it's also people. And certainly um, we need to be able to look to our, some of our funding partners to be able to help us push this work forward. So with that said, um, I'll have um, Dr. Matthew Reese take it over from here and jump into the um, core of our approach and our tool development. Thank you. All right, thanks Cheryl. So we're gonna jump into some of the details of the tools now. And I, I guess the point of what we've seen here so far is that this is work that's been built on the shoulders of a lot of people. I know that we have several of our subcommittee uh, leads on the call here today. Uh, a lot of great work by them and other members of our task force. So what we've done with these three concepts here, and HG had mentioned before, um, carbon uh, vulnerability, which we've termed resilience here, 
and equity. And we think about the three of those concepts as things that add value to a project. And then the question becomes, well, how do you score that? How do you quantify that, that value in, in this kind of context? So we've, we've put together three separate tools. We can go ahead to the next slide. And again, just putting this all in context of these are tools that are looking to, in particular, as we start thinking about it from carbon, to help support the district's goals. The District of Columbia has its goals, which are stated here, a 50% reduction by 2032, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, we're on that journey with the district. And uh, so how can we then look at quantifying some of the projects that we might put forward? So the first tool we'll look at is our carbon tool. And you can go to the next uh, slide where what we do is we look at, you know, with each of these projects, and we have these kind of grouped into various types of projects, looking at solar, looking at sewer thermal, renewable natural gas, co-digestion, we're looking at what impacts our, our fleet conversion can have, for example. And so we look at it as pretty straightforward, it's math. We're looking at what are, for example, the megawatts of renewable energy that could be generated through solar or sewer thermal projects, or we could look at you know carbon avoided, for example, and replacement of diesel fuel uh, through a renewable natural gas type of project. So we then look at this portfolio of projects and we have 15 to 20 projects currently that we're assessing and look at, you know, what is the carbon impact of that? Fairly straightforward. When you get into resilience, we had some discussions on this. Well, what do we mean by resilience or vulnerability? Um, and we came at it from kind of two perspectives. One was looking at it from a community perspective, really kind of the human scale that Cheryl referred to before. Um, and how can these projects have an impact on individuals, on the community, as far as resilience goes, and being able to take some of the potential revenue from this and turning it back into some type of an equity fund. Um, the other concept is infrastructure. Um, and obviously, you know, as a utility, when we think about resilience, we often think about climate resilience. We think about hardening our infrastructure against flooding, uh, sea level rise, et cetera. So, you know, how can these projects, for example, help with standby power opportunities? So it's another way. So we've looked at resilience from those two perspectives. The third tool that we've developed is around equity, which has been mentioned, a very important element here. And we've looked at kind of at, at the tool that was developed and great work um, by the, the subcommittee putting this together. They started by looking at what else is out there right now. They looked at a lot of good information in the transportation sector uh, and some tools that have been developed there. So I looked at kind of three components. One was inclusion and engagement, thinking about jobs, thinking about workforce impacts of these projects. The other was looking at the utility burden. Uh, what is that, that, that bill burden on an individual? And then also in, incorporating uh, community sustainability as well. And then we took a tool, something that we're using, that DC Water is using in our lead pipe uh, replacement program. We call it Lead Free DC. There's something called the Area Deprivation Index, which was developed by the University of Wisconsin. So we're building on tools and indices that are out there already, and that ultimately gets incorporated into the final equity score. So all of these three components together, carbon resilience and equity, are part of what we call the value of each of these projects in our portfolio. But that's not the only impact. You can have a huge value, but there might be a really high cost, for example, to implement a program. So we can go to the next slide and talk about how do we really measure these projects as, as a whole, looking at uh, not only the value, but also the effort it requires. So we've, again, built off some work that was out there previously. Uh, we have this framework that we use called the Value Effort Framework that we use for our innovation program at DC Water. And we incorporated that into the projects that we're bringing forward here for the AEG Challenge. You can go ahead to the next slide. A little bit of explanation of what we mean by this. So, for example, and we're using, um, you know, example values at the top of this slide. So I mentioned RNG before, renewable natural gas. And uh, we've also talked about solar projects. So we've got a phase one at Blue Plains, our advanced wastewater treatment plant. We're looking at a phase two. And we look at for these scores and we workshop all of these scores out. A group of people gets together. How do we score these on carbon? All those elements of equity we mentioned, those uh, two elements of resilience. And in this example, we do equal weighting of each of those components. One of the real values of this tool is that depending on the audience, depending on where we might be pursuing funding, for example, for some of these projects, it might be that DOE is interested in carbon and we have a higher weighting on that. We're working with DHS or HHS where there might be higher weightings on some of the other components. So this tool gives us the ability to simply change some values in a spreadsheet or the weighting 
and that, that results in different value scores. It also allows us to really kind of analyze why does one fall out higher on the list and one lower, for example, gives us the ability to do some analysis after the fact. So that's the value. But then effort is important as well. And without getting into all the details here, we've got four categories that we've applied to assess the effort for each of our projects in our portfolio. Regulatory and legislative effort. You know, do we need certain permits? Do we need, uh, are there regulatory hurdles out there that might prohibit us from moving forward? Funding, of course, is huge. Without dollars, these projects aren't going to move forward. So we look at concepts of, of, of funding. Uh, what's the total amount? Simple PayMac, uh, external funding. Um, the timeline, what does it take for the planning process? What does it take for construction of these projects? How long before we get it in the ground? And there's a lot of elements that play into overall project complexity, you know, looking at different types of, of partners, how many different divisions within the organization are needed to move this forward. So all of this then re results in a quantifiable score for our effort. What we do then, and you can go ahead to the next slide, is take these and put it on what we call the value effort matrix. Now, these are some examples on here. I put a few projects specifically, kind of some dummy projects on here. And the idea is that really what we want is a project that brings high value, but has low effort. So that's the upper left-hand quadrant. Um, and as we work these numbers out and play them around, as you can see, our portfolio projects kinds of uh, can shift as we change the weighting. But again, you know, it, we will look for something in that upper left-hand quadrant. High value, low effort as opposed to something that's lower value, lower effort, but we can still learn regardless from where these projects fall out and why it would be on one part of the matrix versus another. So I think with that, I'm about ready to hand it over to Opera, my colleague, because none of this happens by itself. We really do need to engage a, a broad group of stakeholders. We need to be looking at policy as well. And Opera has been leading that effort and she'll take us from here uh, talking about the, uh, the the policy steps that we're taking now and the stakeholder engagement as well. Thank you, Matt. Um, I know you all have heard a lot of information today, and so just to continue and kind of summarize where we are today, um, as far as bringing the information that you've heard um, full circle to the next steps and where we are in our outreach approach. So I, I can't emphasize enough that this task force was intentional by design based upon the problem statement and our proposed solution, all surrounded on equity, resiliency, and our sustainability goals. We took an inclusive inventory about who was in the room, but most of all, who was not, um, because we didn't want an echo chamber to do this work. And so if you look at the next slide, if you could advance that for me. So we took all of Q1 and most of Q2 ideating, analyzing, and, and quote-unquote perfecting this work. However, we spent most of this time listening, um, not only listening to our colleagues and our co-laborers in this task force work, but listening to um, different groups and organizations, and, and which kind of brings us to this moment and why we are here today. Uh, because it's not only about showcasing this work and ingenuity of the task force, but telling a story and seeking insights of how to advance us even further, what we call the milestone, what we call the deliverable date. So there's internal and external ex uh, outreach that has already started. Um, we have launched a host of congressional briefings, which I'm very excited about. We have a letter to the White House um, that is going out in short order. Um, we have information going out to the Department of Energy, um, the Department of Transportation, all of these different groups, again, showcasing this work, but also um, helping us get to what we are calling the deliverable day. So which is this unified, robust project list of energy solutions that are, are, are captured in equity, resiliency, and sustainability. We are also considering a joint community event with some of our other district agency partners, mm -hmm. as well as other nonprofits, grassroots, and corporate organizations. And the theme here is that it, will, it takes a village to do this work. And so we think that what the task force, what the AEG um, opportunity has given us is how do we take this ingenuity of a crowdsource model and create pilot projects that actually work. And that's how we're being purposeful in our pursuit. So much of what we have done through this process brings to bear many of the issues that remain top priorities, such as equity, resiliency, and sustainability. So we are providing through a means of pilot projects, again, solutions that work. 
So following today's discussion, we will be sending everyone who was registered a summary of what we've discussed today. And we invite you to review these materials. There's again, there was a lot of information that was shared. And so we wanna make sure that we capture that information for you all to take back and chew on, um, but also take to your respective organizations. Because what we will also be asking you to do is what are your thoughts and insights of how to get us to that finish line and beyond um, the goal. And so we, by, by January of 2022, we want a defined, robust list of energy projects that are rooted in equity. And so we need your help and your support on getting us uh, to that finish line. You know, funding is always a top of mind because there's a cost to everything, but there's other things and hurdles that we need to look at from a policy and a legislative perspective. And the, and the framework here is to think outside of the box. So, you know, I, I call them new box solutions because the, the truth is, um, in order to get a new result, you have to think and do something new. So I know that these are, issues that we've been facing for centuries and years, but I do think we are at a prime time um, and a moment of history where we can do something different and do something extraordinary and do something that's long lasting. So we need your help mm -hmm. in getting to the finish line. And with that, I will give it back to, I think, HG. Thanks so much, Opera. And so excited to see how well this is coming together as a task force. Um, I'd like to bring you all on and just talk a little bit about kind of the process and what you've learned that might be helpful to other water utilities that likely are dealing with similar issues and challenges. And then how does this process uh, inform how you look at stakeholder mobilization moving forward? Let's see if I can bring you in for have a little dialogue here with everybody. Welcome, Opera. Let me bring in uh, Matthew as well. Excellent. And then Cheryl bring you well. Let's see if we can put you on right. All right. So I think everybody is able to put their audio on. Maybe we'll get into what you think in terms of this effort, the, the takeaways from this and how it might be helpful to other water utilities that may be watching this or come across this video in the future of things that you've learned to be potentially helpful to them. I can start. I'll just, I'll be incredibly brief because I would love to hear my colleagues um, add on. Um, I think when we first started this effort, um, it felt very um, uh, uh, murky in the beginning. We weren't sure um, exactly, you know, how we would approach it. And I think sometimes that could feel um, incredibly uncomfortable uh, for stakeholders who were trying to take on such a big effort. But we knew what we wanted at the finish line. And so I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was just the um, the ability to bring together such a, a broad base and a, um, a base of support and thought leaders who really complemented each other. It didn't mean that at the beginning of this process that we saw the approaches um, in exactly the same way. But I actually think that this really sets a model for how you really approach any sort of um, difficult uh, policy work or difficult work um, in terms of climate change, because it's around, it's our differences did not become a deficit. If anything, they were an asset, I believe, to this, this effort. And it showed how collective dialogue once um, appreciated and once um, really um, considered and utilized, how that can lead to, um, you know, a, tangible solutions. So uh, at a high level, that's how I would describe this approach. Thank you, Cheryl. And just to reset the room for all of those of you who are watching, uh, I have Cheryl Uday, Senior Advisor to the Chief Operating Officer for DC Water. I have Dr. Matthew Reese, DC Water's Director of Sustainability and Watershed Management. And I have Opera Nguara, who is the Senior Program Manager of Government Affairs for DC Water. They are all part of a task force committed to overcoming an obstacle set forth by their chief operating officer, Kishel Powell, and one of our uh, stakeholder challenges on critical infrastructure and resilience. Uh, so Matthew, I'm curious for you, your takeaway here and, and something that could be helpful to potentially other wa water utilities facing similar challenges of how do they bundle or bring together all their potential projects in a way 
that best serve the public good, especially now that we see how dire the situation is regarding climate change and resilience. Uh, great question. I like the way you framed it, thinking about water utilities as well. And it's not to say that these answers wouldn't be applicable to other utilities or even other parts of government. Um, as I sit here virtually with my, my two colleagues, um, both of whom came on board during the COVID era to DC Water, um, you know, we're bringing in perspectives from outside the water sector. I've, I've worked my entire career in the water sector and have looked at these types of projects. And while there's been excitement around getting to concepts of energy neutrality or carbon neutrality, it's often tough to move those types of projects forward. Water utilities, whether they're an independent water authority like DC Water or a part of a city department, um, are often challenged with doing projects that are outside of their regulatory mandate. Uh, we need to do what we do every day and do it right. That is, we need to deliver clean water 365 days a year. We need to treat that used water 365 days a year and put it back in the Potomac cleaner than, than we got it. And that is at the top of our list. So doing some of these other projects um, and concepts that are not regulatory drivers or don't have regulatory drivers are often a challenge. That said, you just talked about the imperative for us to move forward on some of these programs. And as I mentioned, we're the largest energy consumer in the district. So with that imperative, then how do we move this forward? And one of the ways to do that is to go outside of our traditional boundaries. Uh, Cheryl already hit on it, uh, the, the broad group of stakeholders. So while we may not be a part of the district government, we certainly are working very closely with our colleagues in different departments within the district within the utilities uh, that also serve the district and other NGOs and, and other partners who are um, really at the forefront of some of these issues as well. So I would say, uh, you know, the answer would be, be deliberate about broadening your input base. We can't just be looking inside. We've got to be looking outside. And that, that's just part of the general concept of being a more sustainable utility. So you've got to broaden your viewpoint. Um, the last point I would make is that you don't have to start from scratch. As I mentioned, we built off of work, uh, an index from the University of Wisconsin. We built off of work that was already being done with our lead free DC program. Um, we built off of work that was being done in our innovation program. So build off the work that others have gone before you. We, we would hope that others would build off the work that we're doing here as well, customize it for yourself. And uh, I think there's a lot of tools out there if you actually start to take the time and, and look. Thank you, Matthew. Uh and Opera, your role really ties directly to stakeholder engagement. Uh, when, when you came and got involved in this, what was your first reaction and then how has it changed as you see the task force moving forward and what do you see as possible for this group to achieve? That's a great question. I, you know, I was very excited about this challenge. I, I was almost nostalgic listening to Cheryl talk about how we began um, with the, the looking at the work that was in front of us, it seemed like this um, momentous task that can never really be achievable. But I was very excited about it because I have been in the energy sector my entire career. And um, whether I'm with the gas company, the electric company, renewables, now at the water utility, I never saw um, an avenue by which all of this ingenuity comes together to create a sustainable whole. And that's something that as I was at other utilities and in other facets of my career in the energy sector that I really struggled with because I don't think that we are binary individuals. I don't think that organizations should be binary. I don't think the industry should be binary. I think there's a multi-facet of ingenuity that needs to come and come together and take place um, in order to push something forward. So yes, we have to protect our asset and yes, we have a day-to-day -day thing to do um, and a service to provide, regardless of what industry sector you're in. And for the utility, um, that could be dependent on electricity, whether you're serving renewables, whether you are delivering water for DC residents. But at the end of the day, it takes all of that to create a whole. And so how do we bring all of those pieces together? So to answer your question in short, I was excited because um, for, for once in my career in the energy sector, I wasn't siloed and I didn't have to look through one tunnel vision to get to a solution, but I was able to pull from various disciplines, from various examples, um, from various things that worked um, and able to think outside of a box um, that we're so 
oftentimes boxed into um, as utility providers. So I thought about this as a pivotal and agile moment. And I think that if you approach it um, from a place of wanting to pivot, um, the better. That's great. And I'm sure there's several people listening right now who are excited about the commitment of this task force. Uh, you just have a few more months left to get around to your 12 month final solution, which is something I think Advanced Energy Group does, which is unique. Uh, once we've focused people to align around a critical pain point and then enable people the opportunity to be creative across sectors and silos to develop a solution which people can align on, the next big part of what we do is say, who's willing to volunteer to hold themselves accountable to actually do it in 12 months? and every quarter present your progress for judgment to your peers to say whether or not you're actually doing what you say you're going to do. Uh, and that really speaks to the need to mobilize in terms of urgency and inclusion to get what we need done. Uh, for those watching, excited to get involved and be helpful, what is the next thing you need to be successful in your 12 month quest? I'll just speak to what our milestone three is and because we all have three different roles and what it takes to get to that finish line, I certainly want to invite my colleagues to speak to that. So our milestone three is to prioritize and unify this portfolio. And at each stage and at each milestone, we have, I think, better defined what it means. Um, and so for unifying the portfolio, I mean, that really is um, ensuring that we have the funding support, the political will, um, and our strategic partners aligned and ready to help us really push that across the finish line. And outside of that, I think what's really exciting is that we will have all of our scores also finalized, again, across carbon equity and resilience, as well as those value and effort scores. And I think one of the most important things is that it tells a story when you can um, bring all of the quantitative data together along with um, involving um, and ensuring that we are embedded within our community. And I think one of the really important stories that it will um, show and tell is depending on where our scores fall, not only will we be looking at the value and effort of those and how to actually implement those projects, but if I always say if a project has a low equity score, we should be asking ourselves why. So I think it's it's about this task force and it's about this project, but it's also about our cultural transformation and how we talk about equity across um, all of our projects, not only within DC Water, but across the district. So I'll stop there and hand it to my colleagues. Hey, Opera, I'll, I'll jump in because I think where I end off may be a good place for you to, to jump in, which is, you know, we're talking about the progression of this and we're more than halfway through it now and moving towards that next quarterly goal. Ultimately, this 12 month program is really developing a process. It's a process that others can use after we do. It's a process that hopefully is replicable. The real value in this whole program is getting infrastructure in the ground. Um, we can develop this portfolio, we can unify it, we can prioritize it, and we're going to do all that. And, and we're in the process of doing that. But ultimately, we need to get these projects in the ground so that individuals and, the, and our infrastructure and our grid system can start to see the benefits of those projects. The reality is that requires funding. Um, as we said, you know, these types of projects, we have been working for, for years to kind of to do the engineering around this and to try to make the numbers work. And it's been a challenge being that we are a public utility whose, whose primary mission is to deliver drinking water and, and treat wastewater. Um, but we've got the opportunity, we have a unique opportunity here to advance some of these projects. So uh, the work that uh, Opera and her subcommittee is heading out, that outreach really is going to work on trying to leverage some of the initiatives we have at the federal level now. Um, where can you know, some of this funding come from? Do we look at creative ways to obtain funding for some of these projects outside of how water utilities usually raise money, which is through our through our rate pairs, for example. So that is going to be a key part in this program being a success beyond the 12 months of just the AEG challenge. You hit it right on the head, Matt. I, I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, you know, where the money resides is, is the real um, bang for the buck, and that's the accountability piece, right? Because 
for, for so long, we often talk about things and we do, we, we think high level and we talk about innovation and we talk about equity and we talk about sustainability, but what are we doing about it, right? So right now in front of us, this administration is, is facing the whole building back better and what does that really look like, right? We have a, a, a billion dollar infrastructure bill that's, I believe it's on the Senate side now, and what does that really look like um, when this money is getting handed down to states and jurisdictions? And what is already in play that that money can easily funnel to for things that are project ready? And I think that the work that we've been doing here are those project ready results. Mm. So that's the piece I'm excited about. Yes, I, I heard you mention the letter to the White House. And I was curious, you know, what is the important storyline to that letter based on this experience that you feel is important for the White House? White House to be aware of and appreciative of with this effort? It's really pilot projects that work through this crowdsourcing model. I think that, you know, if, if nothing more, COVID has um, taught us that we are we are bigger than our office buildings and we are, we are bigger than um, the boxes that we're so confined to at times. And I think that um, in this moment of history, like I said, we have never, for the water utility specifically, we haven't seen a, a moment like this as far as funding opportunities for utility projects probably within the last century or so. It's just been a while since there has been an administration that has been so focused and willing to support from a funding aspect um, energy and climate change and resiliency. And so I think that um, if we don't seize this moment, it will be another decade or so plus before we're able to. And so um, right now the moment is right. And so it just so happened that the stars aligned, that we, you know, we had time, you, the Advanced Energy Group, we were introduced to the work that you've been doing, HG. Um, as Matt stated, you know, I joined, uh, Cheryl and I both joined during COVID season, so had no idea about DC Water, about the AEG Group, but we are in this moment of history and we do and we have brought um, our different skill sets and experiences and opportunities to a time such as this. And so that's, that's, that's the work, that's the piece, and that's the letter to the White House is the demonstration through crowdsourcing pilot projects that work and that are ready. It's exciting. You know, there's su such an appreciation for uh, the convergence of equity and resilience uh, from the White House right now in a way that's really hasn't been present in quite some time. So the ability to point to thoughtful engagement uh, across different silos and sectors in advance of any communication and then showing up with a communication that demonstrates that level of inclusive collaboration, thought, my hope is that that's uh, warmly received and appreciated because I think if you're in that position of having to know where to put your money first, you want to go where there's the great alignment, public and private sector around your critical goals. And what I've observed from this task force is how well you stayed on mission to tell that story. And I, I'm curious, you know, when you look at the, the deep dive you've done on projects, was there anything surprising that you found in the data or the process that might be of interest to those watching? I, we've got some great champions out there in the AG network <clears throat> supportive of this type of work. I think of Commissioner Marie Ocanegra, who is the chair of the water group for the NARUC, um, who really has an important role of finding that, that optimal benefit for society for these for these critical utilities that can be provided in a reliable affordable way uh, what are some takeaways you found through this in terms of projects that have surprised you uh, and just to let you know i've opened up this discussion for anybody on linkedin watching who wants to join you can just click on the link and come on to into the conversation and join us but any surprising takeaways yeah, maybe I'll jump in first, and I'm going to give my response from a engineer's perspective. Um, I'm a civil environmental engineer. I've worked in design and construction of water treatment facilities through um, much of my career. Um, 
I think it, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to take one of our value components of resilience. And I, I, a lot of the conversation in the water sector right now is around the, the physical hardening of facilities around uh, or against what we're seeing in changes in climate. Um, what I think has been maybe eye opening or maybe a, in a broadening of perspectives here is that by bringing in uh, and not that engineers can think this way, but frankly, it's good to be bringing in another perspective as well. Just think outside of the technical realm, outside of the what we might physically build uh, to enable some of these uh, value components to move forward. So, as I mentioned, for example, when we talk about resilience, yes, we are looking at infrastructure resilience. We are looking at how these uh, the projects mm -hmm. in our portfolio could help us be more resilient in the case of, say, a power outage, for example. But we're also looking at community resilience. What does that mean from an individual perspective, from a human perspective, from a community perspective? Um, you know, how can we take uh, potential revenue from these projects and turn them into some funds that are really mm -hmm. targeted to where they might be needed most? So there's a there's a human resilience element that I think is has not typically been a part of a typical engineer's conversation. Um, but it has been a part of this, and and I hope that we're you know we'll learn from this and get the word out. And I think it, it makes for a better, more well-rounded portfolio of projects when we do broaden that conversation. Thank you, Ron. And has that led to any specific connection to projects? Um, I one of the things that we've been thinking about is how do we you know, so some of these projects may produce. Um, non-ratepayer revenue. As I mentioned, most water utilities are funded through their, their ratepayers. Um, and we've been thinking about, well, what if we have a non-traditional project, uh, something that's not pipes and pumps and tanks, for example, um, what do we do with that revenue? Is there a way to try to take that to then apply it to address some of the equity issues that we're really trying to focus on here? So it is a, it is a new way of thinking. So we, now you're pulling in economics, what can we do, what type of policies might we need to have in place, how do we engage our board and our stakeholders and thinking about how we direct that and how we prioritize that. So it's a, um, that is a, a, I would call that, a, it's a project, but not necessarily an infrastructure project, it's really a policy project, something that has been, that we identified a need and are spinning off the work that we're doing on that right now. Thank you. Any, any other surprising takeaways or, or lessons learned from the process that would be interesting to share? Yeah, I like what, what Matt said about um, going beyond the pumps and the pipes in the ground, um, because again, I think it will, for us, it sets the model and the approach by, um, we were having, up and I were having this conversation yesterday about legacy and it just being bigger than even just this moment, but a really about how we work going forward. So, um, you know, it may completely change the way in which this, the engineering and the industry, the water industry in and of itself begins to think about concept and design and bridging community and resilience in those conversations before we even begin to develop a project scope or before we even begin to tease out the, the cost of a project, right? And so I think, again, um, for me, when I think of a project portfolio, um, those conversations need to be um, happening at the onset um, as opposed to uh, a, a reactive way in which we approach our project work. Makes sense. Well, this has been great to just have this dialogue with each of you and hear how things are moving forward. It seems like you have a clear next step that you are going towards and you've got your different subcommittees working together. Uh, this is really touching you know, several levels within DC Water. Can you share a little bit about the engagement that this has created within DC Water itself and, and how that's interfacing with the outside community through this effort? I actually, that's the piece I've actually been very excited about. And actually to go back on your other question about what has been the biggest surprise in this process. So as I stated, I, I've been in the energy sector my entire career. Um, as a girl from Houston, Texas, where oil is king, right? So I am, um, I have just been delighted and surprised by 
the amount of intentional and, and forethought. You know, I almost laugh when I hear Matt says, you know, by design, I'm an engineer, so I'm very, I think as an engineer, I think as a project, but the questions that um, have come from Matt and the rest of the team of engineers and non-engineers have been so on point and have been so beyond the scope of just the project that it has been uh, very humbling and um, just unexpected surprise because I'm co-laboring with people that um, are very tactical and are very um, careful and, and do all types of risk modeling. Um, but they're also asking, well, what more should we be thinking about um, when it comes to the community? And why is this a problem? And how in, my, in the everyday work that I do from a design concept to a mapping to construction to build, um, how am I doing that and, and, and how am I showing up uh, for the community to which I serve? And that has been the most amazing piece of this work and this process to me because I believe that it lays the platform for everyone to ask those types of questions and be vulnerable um, in asking those types of questions, not only of ourselves, but um, for the partners that we are working and doing this work with. Um, so I think at for BC Water, we're just showing up um, in just a, a, a different way, in an unexpected way than your traditional utility has ever before. And that piece um, is what's exciting and propelling this work. Nice. We just got some feedback that those watching are really inspired by this level of collaboration. And I have to tell you that, <clears throat> you know, my main inspiration years ago, my dream was to be an architect. I was just enthralled by the concept and you know totally romanticized it and it was all about being able to be artistic and then also be effective you know dream something and deliver and when i saw how much um, people especially mayors and those in positions that truly felt responsible for many people's well-being were stepping forward with these promises on decarbonization and equity they were making such bold promises I felt that sense of inspiration, but from my experience in architecture, I realized there's a big gap between a promise made and a promise delivered, especially when it crosses so many different silos to actually make that happen. And I think, you know, appreciating silos is something and how difficult it is to bridge them is something, especially if you're a person of color, you can appreciate because you know how difficult they are sometimes to even see, but that they're very present and very ingrained in so many aspects of what we do. And the truth is, to be successful on this particular challenge relating to the welfare of so many, we need to see our common humanity first and really inspire ourselves to work towards the greatest, those who are most vulnerable. And I feel that this task force, by approaching this from a critical pain point, from the beginning has really kept that at the center. And I see it when I see members of your team digging in and creating that equity model and spending hours creating this immensely elaborate spreadsheet to figure that out. But coming at it with such joy, I really see it happening. So I just wanna share my appreciation for how well I feel you have taken this opportunity and run with it beyond my greatest hopes so thank you for the inspiration and i am definitely all in to help you be successful and I hope there are others watching who feel the same and i've had someone ask will the recording be available they would like to learn more so continue to lead on and share your work with others and if there's anything that you want to share with those watching that would be as specifically helpful to you please in your final remarks i welcome you to share that Maybe we'll start off with you, Matt, and go to you, Opera, and then finish with you, Cheryl. Glad to watch afterwards. Hope that we inspire some others to go down a similar path. Um, my closing comment, I think, will build off of your question about engagement. Um, one of the things that we've seen here, and you know, think about who is the target audience for, for this discussion, uh, it's a lot of different levels, but it also could be organizational leadership. We want to, you know, really reinforce the support that we have had um, from not only our executive sponsor, Keisha Powell, our COO, but from our CEO, David Gaddis, and our entire senior executive team. 
you have that kind of support coupled with the response we've got from our board of directors when they've been briefed on the project and other leaders, that really helps you get going on this. And, and it's like any type of program, you get that executive level support that really kind of kickstarts this kind of effort. So it's the kind of place we, you or others may want to target this kind of effort in the future to really get this off the ground. That has really helped jumpstart this effort. So. Again, um, look forward to seeing progress and ultimately infrastructure in the ground is where the rubber meets the road. So looking forward to seeing that down the road. Thanks, HG. Thank you, Matt. We're looking for site visits to for site visits to demonstrate <laughs> that uh, in the ground. Uh, I'll throw it to you. I definitely echo um, Matt's sentiments. I would just you know, say again to journey with us. You all will be receiving, everyone who is registered will be receiving a summary of what was discussed as well as just your feedback on how you can get us to what we call B-Day and Deliverable Day. We love to hear those insights. Definitely, it's never too late to join the task force if you would like to. So we want to make sure that we, we send all the materials to you and, and, and get you the information on how you can be involved um, and get us to projects in the ground in an equitable and resilient and sustainable manner. Thank you. And Cheryl. Sorry about that. Pass the opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I didn't want to pass up on the opportunity to also really thank um, our partners who have been engaged with us literally since day one um, back in early January. Um, and again, we we needed to step outside of our own industry way of thinking to be able for this to really be um, as, success, as successful as it is. So. Parting words is, you know, bring everybody in, bring in um, those who were from politics and policy and social work, um, your engineers, your funding, your um, philanthropists. Um, and, I, and I really, really believe that that's part of what has made this incredibly unique and thoughtful and, and certainly intentional. So we, we hope that others um, follow in these footsteps, but, you know, we also hope to be able to collaborate and learn from others as well. So thank you so much for allowing us um, this opportunity, HG and AG. Thank you, and I want to make sure I acknowledge our sponsors who make this platform possible. We have an extraordinary collection of public and private sponsors that believe in this work, that believe in going from stakeholder engagement to stakeholder mobilization is going to take forums like this to make it happen. So I'm very grateful for that to enable me this opportunity to create this forum for you all and watch it grow. And if this is something you want to learn more about. AEG Washington meets next for Q4 on mobility and transportation. Uh, that's coming up. If you're interested to be to receive an invitation to participate, you'll have an opportunity to hear the update from the DC Water Task Force at that Q4. This will be their last quarterly update before D-Day in Q1 to present their final 12 month solution. So reach out to us. We'll make sure you get that invitation. Thank you all so much for your time today. I look forward to the next steps. Lead on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank nice. you so much. Bye-bye.